Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Piper Hendricks and I'm the Executive Director of Stories Change Power. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit that provides professional development in advocacy communications, specifically meaning communications to change laws, policies, and systems. And I'm delighted to be joined by our friends today at the Public Interest Communication Educators Network for an important conversation around artificial intelligence and public interest communications. Um, so imperative that we be protecting the, the public interest as we move into this era with artificial intelligence. We want to, to get a better understanding before we get started of where all of you are when it comes to AI. I know some folks are brand new and some are, are you know, potentially experts. So let's bring up a poll and we invite you to, to pop your answers in. Um, and let us know where, if you've had a chance to, to dive in to, to public, to AI, if you've read some about AI, um, one moment here, we'll make sure that the, the poll is, there we go. That should be appearing on your screen. Um, and just let us know where, where you are on, on that scale of, you know, how familiar you are with artificial intelligence. Um, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll just a reminder, we've got the, the chat open for respectful conversations. If you've got questions, please put those. There's a Q&A down in the middle bottom part of your screen. Put those there and we'll have time at the end of the session to, to hear your questions and to answer those. If we're not able to get to those today, then rest assured, we will try to get you an answer in a different way after the, the session. Um, if you have any tech difficulties or need to step away at any point, don't worry. We'll be recording this session and we'll share the recording when we're done. Um, so it looks like we've got a good number of, of responses here in the poll. Let's, let's pop those up. Um, and it looks like, let's see, um, we've got about... All right, um, so folks who, who have read some or some using it personally, um, so we're, we're right there in the middle. And that's really helpful for our panelists um, to have an understanding of, of where all of you are. So thank you for that. And it is now a delight to, to introduce those panelists. We are joined by three experts today who will share great insights. Um, we've got Alisa Miller, who is the CEO of Pluralytics, which is a human-driven AI-powered language intelligence platform. Um, she is a tech founder, member of the Global AI Council of Cordera, chair of the Lumina Foundation Board of Directors, and former chairwoman and CEO of Public Radio International, PRI. So welcome, Alisa. Glad you're with us today. Um, we also have Becca Bicott, who is the founder and principal of Meeting the Moment Advisory. That is a consulting firm that helps senior executives and nonprofit leaders realign their organizations to address issues that are redefining our world, um, including the impact of artificial intelligence. Uh, prior to consulting, Becca spent several years focused on the latest issues in AI and ethics and digital transformation in leading the Fiscal Note Executive Institute, a thought leadership network for senior executives at global companies. And we also have Nicholas Wittenberg, who's joining us today. He's a corporate counsel and senior advisor for legal technology and innovation at our media. His previous positions include serving as senior legal counsel at the White House Office of Science and Technology po Policy. I'm very glad to have you with us today, Nick, and I'm glad to have you, Becca. And then our moderator today is Nader Dagger. From the, he's um, based in Gainesville, Florida, joining us from the University of Florida, a doctoral student, which which means he's always working, never sleeping, and graduate assistant at the University of Florida. Um, he is a member of the Public Interest Communications Educators Network. And I'd also like to thank Luna Gonzalez, who is working um, in the background with, with our technology. Um, she'll be answering any questions that you've got in the chat and providing links and resources along the way. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And with that, um, Nader, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Piper. Uh, welcome, everyone. Technology has been changing our lives for the past years, of course, decades, and uh, but this, in the past few years, with the rise of AI, this change seems to be accelerating. Bill Gates said two months ago that AI is going to be uh, transformative to everyone's life uh, within the, the next five years. So my question to Becca is, how did we get here? What is the story behind AI technology. 
Sure. Well, thank you, Nader and Piper, for organizing this. I'm honored to be on this panel with my fellow panelists. And let me begin by saying that we're in sort of a time warp with AI right now. Technically, it's been around for almost 70 years, and it's a part of our everyday lives in various ways. For example, if you've ever used Alexa or Siri, or we've all heard of self-driving cars, we've seen product recommendations on Amazon or movies that Netflix recommends to us. And these are all just ways that it's been a part of our lives for many years now. And to paraphrase the computer scientist and co-founder of Coursera, Andrew Ung, AI is like electricity. It's transforming almost everything. And the difference between AI and electricity, however, is that with AI, we're seeing incredibly accelerated new iterations and innovations with what it can do daily, even hourly at lightning speed. And as Piper mentioned earlier today, when you glance at the headlines right now, AI is always in the news. So it feels very novel and urgent, although it's actually been with us for several decades now. And I think to understand the technology of AI and the history, it really helps to distinguish between what's called traditional AI and generative AI. And traditional AI works with a specific set of inputs to suggest a solution within an existing framework. A good example of this is in 1997, IBM had something called Deep Blue, and it was an expert system that beat the world reigning chess champion because it understood how to generate a winning outcome based on the specific rules of the game of chess. Whereas generative AI, many of us know that from in 2022 when OpenAI introduced ChatGPT. And that is where you're basically given something entirely new based on a few specific inputs. For communicators and journalists, this might mean going to a generative AI design platform and saying, I want to design a logo based on this phrase and giving it a couple colors. And within a couple of seconds, having hundreds of versions of a logo you could consider using or using chat GPT to write an email. So those are some differences between traditional and generative AI. Um, there also is something called super AI, which people say is when AI will completely surpass human beings and in intelligence. And this is what many people are sometimes afraid of when you think about the movie Terminator and machines taking over or just machines replacing your jobs. And then there's something I read about recently that I think is a good theme for all these different types of AI, and it's human-centered AI, where we really think about our roles as ethical and creative leaders and how we're collaborating with AI as a creative partner versus sort of driving it to make us the most money and without thinking about the ethical consequences. I also just want to highlight two other quick things that relate to some of the legalities and um, the milestones in AI's legal history. We've seen a lot of pushback through various lawsuits and strikes that the creative community has done to protect their work from generative AI. Um, the most landmark case of this was probably last year when the Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild of America went on strike over fair wages and the use of AI in their work. And this led to a historic deal that put up guardrails and how um, AI can encroach on writers' works. And basically it said that they that studios couldn't use AI to write or rewrite any scripts or treatments. Um, studios had to disclose if any material was given to writers that was AI generated. And it really protected writers from having their scripts used to train AI without their permission. And this leads me to one more quick case that I wanted to mention, and that is the New York Times suing OpenAI and Microsoft last year for um, infringing on its copyrights by using millions of its articles to train AI technologies like ChatGPT. And the final quick question I just wanna to pitch to all of us is thinking about who are the history makers with AI when we look at its technological innovation and development. And an important question is, are we identifying the right history makers? Is there anybody who's left out of the mix? Um, I've done a lot of writing on AI. And one thing that I noticed last year was there was a gender equity crisis happening with it. Um, the New York Times wrote an article on the history of AI and they failed to include any women who've been making incredible contributions over its history. There was a huge backlash for that. Also looking at how we have a handful of giant tech companies that are really developing this technology and inviting the question, are they thinking about the inclusion? Are they thinking about the economic mobility, the digital equity access of AI? Thank you, Becca. Uh, these are very important questions and we will come to 
ask some of these, especially when it comes to professions and, and perspectives on what's going to happen uh, for some of the jobs. But um, before we get to our themes, uh, the ethics, accessibility, and impact of AI, I, I would like to ask our guests to share uh, a brief overview, like in three minutes, uh, um, how do you relate to AI and what does it mean to you? And if you allow me, we can start with Lisa and then Nick and uh, back to you, Becca. But I need to unmute. I was just saying, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so I'm, as, as, as you heard, I'm CEO and co-founder of Pluralytics, and I, I, I come to AI from an unexpected uh, background, having been in public media, um, but I've always been curious about why people connect with the content that they do, and why don't they connect with the content that they do? And so began uh, investigating and working on AI to help solve or uh, understand more about that problem. And so uh, as a founder of an AI powered company, we use language intelligence or we use AI, a software that basically helps communicators to understand who their content is likely to appeal to based on the words that they use through a combination of AI and behavioral science and ultimately understanding what makes good narrative storytelling. So in essence, what it does is it helps you know who you are likely to connect to, to benchmark, to look for message effectiveness and analytics, which is a key strength um, of AI generally speaking, which we'll, we'll talk more about, and ultimately how you can refine and optimize what you're doing so that as a human who is trying to connect with different kinds of people, how can you do that most effectively? Um, I've had a front row seat to being a part of the generative AI kind of revolution uh, in that uh, Pluralytics, the company that I co-founded was a pilot partner of OpenAI since May of 21. So we had a sense of kind of what was coming from a Gen AI perspective prior to ChatGPT. I'm also an unlikely AI patent holder, um, and we can talk more about sort of barriers or actually doors that AI can open for people, and we'll touch on that a bit later um, in our conversation. I think the one takeaway I would have for uh, everyone on the call is just because you ask Gen AI to do something, it doesn't mean that it's actually correct or right. So uh, just because you say, please do this for me, it doesn't mean that it's actually giving you something that's correct or right. So the key to taking advantage of this technology is to have analytical tools and people, right, involved so that you can assess what success looks like um, and infuse that human element in your workflows so you can benefit from the potential upside and efficiencies and being able to see patterns and things that aren't possible without the use of this technology, but also to mitigate the downside risks. Yeah, thank you so much for having me this afternoon to, to speak on this awesome topic. Uh, my background comes in uh, from the legal field um, using you know, in litigation context, um, the kind of the forerunners, technology assisted review, um, and data is exploding. And my work in government has allowed me to really work with some of our exciting policymakers, uh, really trying to get this right. And I'm a big fan of the Terminator. I, it, you know, it, I think they did a number of instances of it, but I think the original, we'll say number one and two, um, the humans win. And so even if we look at in the legal field, if I use AI to assist me, legal research, writing a brief, reviewing a contract, um, I have to ensure it's correct or I could put my ticket on the line. And that was still the case under the management principles. If you have a young associate uh, who's doing some research and, and drafting that initial brief, you've got to review that. Um, so that is something where... You know, it's, it's nerve wracking, but it's exciting. And that really, I think the excitement for me comes, this is not just limited to one field. We see automotive, we see environmental, we see, you know, national security. We see a lot of 
organizations and institution really getting into the game. And, and I think as we were, you know, chatting at the beginning is generative AI is, is day, you know, a week where there's some topic discussion um, that is pushing forward. So that is exciting. It's definitely not a static field. And it's one that really, uh, as data grows, maybe that information is more accessible and we can make some, some, you know, uh, reports quicker. So whether that's, you know, environmental issues, um, where traditionally that could have been going through reams and reams and reams of paper or systems that didn't chat with each other, we can get real time health information out there, um, for our public. And how do we communicate that with, with our communications professionals, our, our news industries, our policymakers, um, and that is something where really that is that is the 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 excitement of it. And I think also you know, we have to be cautious about what is in that information. I may have gotten a report within seconds, but is you know is is that correct? Um, as we all see with weather forecasts, uh, sometimes that isn't as accurate. But we want to make sure we can we can get a little closer to that. Um, and so this is a solution. I think uh, it's nice to have conversation with professionals um, from all different walks of life, um, so we can really get this correct out there. And um, I'm the founder and principal of Meeting the Moment Advisory. And prior to launching my own firm, I ran a thought, thought Leadership Institute where we focused on AI and ethics in various discussions. We talked about AI and disinformation. Um, we had a continuing legal education course for lawyers who wanted to understand AI, AI and ethics. And we talked a lot about the social good and the positive impacts of AI as well. And I, now with my current firm, I do quite a bit of research and writing on the various developments with AI, particularly as it affects senior leaders and how they want to maybe realign their companies and organizations so that they're better um, and more authentically addressing some of the issues that we're going to talk about today. I also spend a lot of time talking to senior leaders about how they're approaching AI. So I tend to come at these issues from all angles and I really believe in intersectional conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, talking about ethics where you just ended up, uh, the question for Nick is uh, about the ethics. We know AI will keep learning from us, will keep learning about us uh, and it feeds on information that we uh, uh, give. So uh, there is a risk here, uh, risk of AI manipulating our emotions and behavior. And there is a risk of uh, kind of like the privacy of the information that AI collects uh, about us. Would you start by sharing like the big picture of the current regulations of AI? What's missing in terms of policies and what regulating AI should look like? No, these are, these are great questions that, that we, we, you know, have been looking at. And I think in Washington, it's an exciting time um, as one who attends a number of house and Senate hearings. These are bipartisan um, events where we want to get this right. And there's not an easy button, unfortunately. And, you know, the white house just passed the AI executive order uh, that, that came uh, right with the uh, AI bill of rights. And so the conversation is really rich right now in, in the policy at, at the national level. Um, you know, how do we regulate that? It becomes a real interesting issue. Is our current uh, regulations acceptable? You know, fraud is fraud, whether it's, it's through the mail or through the Internet. Um, do we need a new agency or do we want to give our, our current agencies the, the, the framework uh, to do that? Um, that has really been going on. And these questions have just been producing more and more, I think, questions about that. Um, you know, we also want to make sure the AI, the results, the accuracy, you know, the, the ability to have repeating um, instances. Um, so that is something, too, that, that's come up. Um, but we really, what we're, I think the concern becomes issues of, of privacy, uh, consumer regulations, uh, bias that is out there. How's the underlying data uh, obtained? Uh, you know, how's it being trained um, and we you know we have instances of deep fakes so authentication of, of evidence is becoming a big issue too so we have a lot of issues that are out there the fear sometimes is is we need to overcorrect with with more regulations and that could stifle creativity think of sarbanes oxley um, that really had a lot of requirements uh, for for reporting 
And this is an interesting field because we have, you know, startups, we have academic institutions, some organizations, they can keep up with the regulations and it may be costly for them, but unfortunately some, you know, not be, be able to get there. So this is the point is that how do we provide confidence, privacy um, for, for those who are out there and interested, but at the same time wanting to make our, our public protected? Because if you were to sell an airplane, you need a license. Um, do you need a license to create AI, to resell AI, to use AI? Um, so that's something we should think about. If we step back about 20 years, the Section 230 of the Internet Decency Communication Act came about, in part because of our good friend Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. Prodigy, an internet company, was pulling down his post. And in doing so, they thought they were doing the right thing, but they became synonymous with a book publisher versus a bookseller. So these tiny little internet companies helped and have now 230 for immunity. So if we were discussing in a platform some nefarious activity, they'd be protected. Through a number of hearings, though, that immunity is wanting to be peeled back. And we've seen some cases go to the Supreme Court, whether it's a Google v. Gonzalez, the Twitter case, or just last week, the Murphy v. Missouri regarding social media. Um, so these issues are hitting on the ethical challenges that are out there um, and involving a lot of folks in the conversation um, without trampling on, you know, the First Amendment rights that we have out there. So those are good issues. Um, we also have standing orders from federal judges that are instructing counsel. If you use AI, you have to note that in your in your filings. Um, we also had a case where a judge uh, enforced a, a, um, a policy for an airline, a refund policy, because the AI dictated that. Um, I also like to call attention to Judge Scott Schlegel, who's down in New Orleans, wonderful judge, um, number of awards. And he put a call to action, um, putting for education over regulation. And in his letter, he even noted he used chat GPT out there. Um, so that's a really great point. And I also want to give a nice hat tip to, to academia. Um, if you just go to ai.ufl.edu at the University of Florida, wonderful information in there. Um, so we also see kind of institutions. Um, that are suspending their plagiarizing detection software because they're encouraging students and professors and researchers to use generative AI, but it was tripping up the plagiarizing software. So that is something. And then another huge shout out to University of Florida. Uh, Professor Bill Hamilton at their College of Law did a wonderful e-discovery conference that talked about a lot of the legal issues um, that we've kind of touched on today regarding generative AI, ethics, privacy, and those policies. But the exciting thing about our conversation today is we have individuals from different backgrounds. And I think that is something I've seen in the fray, whether it's at a hearing, um, there's a lot of organizations, institutions, and individuals who have important points to be, to be noted here. Thank you, Nick. Um, perhaps the second question to Becca is, seeing AI advancing in our lives, are you worried about our well-being? Are you worried about employment, professionalism, uh, or even advancing weapons through AI technology? Wow, okay, <laughs> there, there's a lot in that question. I love it. Um, well, first of all, I do think in general, there is definitely a lot of anxiety and distrust around AI right now. And it's fueled honestly by a lot of people having what I would say is almost like a professional identity crisis with their jobs. Um, they, they're worried about having to upskill. They're worried about keeping up with the different paces of AI's technology and, and learning everything they need to to stay relevant. They're having to face the fact that they're probably gonna have to delegate parts of their jobs to machine learning. And so I think people are feeling unsettled by that. Um, equally so if you're a creator and suddenly some of your information, such as a photograph or something you've written, can be scraped off the internet and regurgitated by generative AI into something that has no attribution in a totally different context. All that being said, though, um, I think there's so much promise and there's a lot of creativity and entrepreneurship with AI right now as well with people's well-being. It's um, giving people so many opportunities to upskill and grow on their own. And that I think is really igniting their creativity and entrepreneurship, which I think is very promising. I know that I've felt this while setting up my company. I've used generative AI to create the logo and you know write different titles and kind of brainstorm a bit on some writing I've done. I think in terms of 
Other aspects of employment that are confusing for companies is there's a lot of pressure on them to set up AI governance and employees are looking for more transparency on how to use AI. And only 33% of companies have really shared their AI governance with employees. Similarly, with all this pressure to upskill, some of the most talented technologists at companies have said in a recent study I read this morning from McKinsey, like 51% of them are looking to leave their jobs in three to six months because they know they're hot commodities and they know that they have the upper hand. So you've got companies trying to respond to, uh, to AI, make it a part of how they're training their employees, but you've got massive disruption from people who are leaving and feeling uncertain about their roles. Um, for mass uh, weapons of mass destruction, I think a bigger issue that a lot of people are thinking about with it being 2024 is the role of deep fakes that Nicholas highlighted earlier. Um, there's tremendous anxiety around whether or not we're gonna be able to, to really address different imagery that's gonna surface, different messaging that's gonna surface around the 64 global elections that are happening this year. I also think cybersecurity and privacy breaches are of a huge concern, especially to different governments as it relates to AI. Thank you, Becca. Um, let's move to our efficacy and accessibility uh, uh, theme. And the, the question for Elisa, Alisa, your company uses AI to help firms connect with their audiences. And you suggested earlier in a conversation that uh, AI could be the most democratizing technology of the present time. At the same time, we know AI can be democratized or democratizing if people can gain equal access to it, equality in terms of using or developing or investing in the AI. So how can you, how can we ensure uh, fair participation in AI industry and who controls the world of AI such that it can be open to all? Well, this is the uh, estimate of the 20% of GDP uh, that AI will deliver question. It's not the million dollar question, it's whatever 20% of GDP is <laughs> um, by 2030, it's a big number. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we know that AI offers a lot of opportunity, and I think what we've been talking about here is, and reminding ourselves, is to balance that that progress with the unforeseen consequences of our of our creations. And so we're talking about how can we create a world where AI empowers humanity and not overshadows it, right? So it's kind of in the the spirit of that. that oh, who controls AI is a really important question. And I'll just reinforce something that Nick said earlier, um, my paraphrase, uh, that we do really need to allow for the innovation sector and for new entrants and players um, to be a part of how AI is shaped and how it evolves and not having it fall in the hands of just a few very large companies, right? The very large companies have unprecedented capability to help lead and to create amazing things. So it's not an anti-big company thing, but it's also making sure that the ecosystem is broad enough um, so that when we're talking about, particularly when we're talking about regulation around transparency, security, other systems, Nick alluded to this earlier, we need to be careful that the solutions or the regulations, right, that are coming into play aren't inadvertently squelching or stopping the smaller players from playing because no one else can meet those benchmarks but the largest companies. So it's not a simple, it's not a simple thing to navigate, but certainly that's important when we talk about the ecosystem of AI, who's creating it. Now, I also think when we talk about who uses it, it's very, uh, and that's where I do have kind of on the one hand, on the other hand, but a very hopeful view. It can be an equalizer. Um, it allows for people to create applications who do not code, right? It allows people who to be an unlikely tech entrepreneur. You know, I'm, I'm one of those, right? I'm a middle-aged Midwestern woman, right? Who does not have an engineering degree, who now happens to have an AI patent, right? And part of what made that possible 
was a way of thinking that helped me invent with my co-founders a patented AI technology, but it was about how I think. And I was able to bring that to the table. And Gen AI is a way to help you make some of those um, opportunities possible. So I'm not a utopian technologist. I, I don't think that, um, that everything is perfect because of AI, but I do think it doesn't have to be a barrier. We can think about it as an open door. You know, we've talked for years about a lack of diversity in technology. What if AI could help us overcome those barriers? Because you're not having to go through a specific, even education process to necessarily try it, build something, et cetera. Doesn't mean that education isn't important and we'll get to more of that later um, in terms of what sets you up to be successful. But it does mean that it can open the door to different kinds of people. So AI can help you save time, it can help you analyze, it can help you develop applications in hours and days, not weeks and months. And I think there is a real powerful opportunity um, there as long as people have access. And I think we can talk more about that. But, you know, from my past life in public media, you know, there's ways to think about the public space and there's ways to think about access that perhaps we can also apply to the AI world. Thank you, Lisa. Um, maybe we should turn back to Nick and ask the question uh, uh, whether um, or uh, uh, because this technology will include all aspects of our lives and it might be more complicated than anything we have seen before so far. Um, should we expect different kinds of regulations, Nick? Uh, uh, for example, users feed AI with the information or data, and but, but they don't get to benefit from their input unless they pay. And um, um, is there, a, like, do we have to, do we have to expect uh, uh, this to remain the case? Is there any um, possible solution to this unbalanced uh, kind of formula when we deal with AI? No, that's a great question. And I think Becca touched on it with the Screen Actors Guild and content creation. And we've been here before, if, if we all remember Napster, um, which, which you could not go into a record store and take an album, but then the illegal download situation occurred is when iTunes came out and a lot of other uh, song and, and video platforms that you had to pay for and really made that accessible. And even artists um, who may have not had the production or those type of expensive uh, avenues were able to get access and, and paid. And so that's something I think it's becoming to the front here too, is a lot of these catalogs that we have online um, with, with you know Shazam or other things that can recognize the content is royalties. And so that is something that that's becoming up. And I think too, um, as it just alluded to before, is, is allowing for, uh, you know, smaller uh, players to get into the game is the ability to, um, you know, for example, if you pay $20, you can get chat GPT. I'm not a code uh, coder by background. And, and, and that is something that's really neat. I mean, there is very sophisticated systems that we see uh, generative AI being developed daily. Um, and so that is something that, that I think will, will also come up, but I still, there's a lot of, uh, um, lawsuits that are out there about scraping the internet and getting royalties um, back. So, you know, would users be comfortable giving up some of their privacy and they, but they get monetized and get paid for it. That's a question to be determined. Um, but I think it's one that we really, um, we want to make sure we have our protections in place um, because it is something, you know, with back to the two thirty is there's been discussion about allowing the courts to, to have these suits go up there and kind of put in the framework. Um, and, and that is something too, that will be helpful um, because a lot of this, unfortunately right now is, is to be determined and unknown um, that is out there. So that is something where, yes, there potentially could be regulations and not, you know, looking at the federal system, but we also have to be mindful of our state. Um, if we, if we look at privacy and cyber uh, security uh, frameworks as, as guiding uh, for, that is, you know, started with California and Texas, um, so that is something I, I'm, I'm pretty interested in seeing is the courts and regulations uh, give individuals better uh, frameworks to, to decide how to develop or what is out there for them to ensure their privacy is protected. Thank you, Nick. 
Um, let's turn to our third uh, topic, which is the impact of AI. And uh, Becca, you have noted uh, that people can make like kind of like shiny new toy approach to AI and end up complicating things that do not need uh, necessarily uh, AI technology uh, after all. Um, some academics noted that AI can be replacing humans in journalism, in marketing, and other professions uh, like research uh, because it's more time and energy efficient than humans and more accurate than humans. Now, how are you going to belong? How are we going to belong to this world where you, we are replaced with, with AI? And how do you recommend we even get um, education, educational, uh, maybe uh, um, it, as individuals and societies, how we can go through this experience and still belong to uh, this environment? Well, I think my philosophy has always been be cautious, curious, and willing to learn. And I think learning about AI and upskilling in a few areas of AI doesn't mean you're completely signing on and supporting to everything AI represents, and you're not selling your soul to AI. <laughs> you're thinking of AI as a creative collaborator, not an automated servant that will do exactly what you need all the time. And I think all everybody's kind of touched on this in different ways. I think if you're absolutely shutting the door on AI, you're saying you don't wanna be a part of a very ever present conversation that's fundamentally changing how we're living and working. So again, reiterating, you can be cautious, curious, and willing to learn. And I think that relationships between people will always be strong. I don't think AI is gonna take that away from us. Um, silly example, but a friend of mine lives in Seattle and she was telling me she went to the Starbucks where they have AI baristas that make your coffee and they're constantly making mistakes. There isn't that fun banter that you have with someone you always see when you go to your local cafe and do your research. Um, similarly, I work a lot with you know leaders at companies and the I think it's the new CEO of Starbucks has said he's going to work as a barista once a month to really understand the relationships that his company and really bring his company forward. And that has nothing to do with AI. It has to do with him preserving those important relationships. However, all of us can be active players. We can all make a point of learning about it in different ways um, and realizing we're always learning. There are no experts in AI, in my opinion. I think it's changing in so many places around the world that you just have to zone in on what relates to you personally and what you care about as a human being and try to stay on top of those latest developments. Um, I also think not to be super uh, doomsday here, but I think what's going to bring us back to reality is in the future, we are probably going to see some major mistakes that companies and organizations make by over relying on AI that could lead to some high profile crisis PR moments. I think this is going to temper the no holds barred kind of wild, rest, wild west gold rush we're seeing right now. And it's going to kind of bring us back to this reminder that we need governance we need to temper regulation with innovation. We need to have economic mobility and how we allow people to be a part of the process. But again, I just think being open to learning about it and while being cautious is the best way to go. Thank you, Becca. Uh, perhaps, Elisa, you would have something to say here. Your company has created AI for people to use. And uh, so what would you add in terms of how we can cope with the impact of AI in our society or our economy? Do you have recommendations regarding making AI more useful for better use uh, and to protect the public interest while serving big businesses? Uh, great question. I really love the cautious, curious, and willing to learn uh, that Becca said. Um, because I think, you know, when I when I think about this and I'm kind of coming, also putting my kind of purpose-driven organization hat on from a, a career of caring about how, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, et cetera, how are you actually impacting the world in a positive way? And I think um, almost, every, I'm sure everyone on this call feels the same way about kind of purpose-driven work that they're doing. And so my advice is that from a sector of purpose-driven people, um, 
I think it's really important to use this technology to learn about it, right? And to, to Becca's point, this isn't about having it take over your job or start turning over everything to it, but actually interacting with it makes us smarter in our critique of it, even as we are trying to advocate for the best versions of it. But if we think about who else is going to be part of developing purpose-driven uses other than the purpose-driven sector, right? We have very important perspective on technology and, and on the world. And having us experiment with pilot, use, learn from it is a key part of making sure that we are a part of defining its future, right? Um, so I would say I would say that as a part of making sure that um, the public interest is a part of that spectrum, right? Um, we have to, we we have to engage with it to be informed um, informed critiques and advocates for it. I think you were also sort of getting to, well, how do you think about this from an organizational perspective and who's using it? And I think in the future, you know, hiring people who have been in arts and humanities, not just technology, um, it's about tech savvy hum humanities people. I think they will be some of the most in, um, in demand people in the future because this is about how you can apply this to solve problems, people who have context around what the problems are. And having that multidisciplinary point of view that includes people who can come at it from various lenses of arts and science and business, et cetera, being able to have that perspective, that is what will make some of the most powerful AI applications, right? Um, so, to, the, to that end, it doesn't render college unuseful, <laughs> you know, as a part of as a part of the picture. In fact, I think it will help to underscore that growing our capacity to problem solve, provide content context, and apply uh, creativity will be critical to future skills. Right. So we need to think about that as a part of you know our collective work and kind of educating, preparing, and um, running organizations that are trying to do uh, good things in the world. Great, thank you. Um, continuing on the same topic with Nick. Nick, how do you respond to people who are raising concerns of the new technology? Uh, now, this goes on, uh, this is true to regular people and to even philosophers. Uh, we have philosophers who said that this could be the end of history as we know it, as the, the human dominated history. And so this is like um, not the uh, um, very uh, uh, positive uh, expectation that they, but these are concerns and people are concerned. So um, what can you tell these people? Yeah, no, I, I'm optimistic. And I think uh, Becca alluded to her favorite video, The Terminator, how the humans win is we, we've had this tension of man versus machine. And, and as Becca noted, as AI is seven years uh, old and, and it's ebbed and flowed. We've seen in the past 10 years. Uh, town, you know, with 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 navigation programs and, and song selection and and shopping. Um, but with generative AI, it's really it's really pushed it out there. But I look at an opportunity like this as our, our laboratories of democracy, you know, for me as a lawyer, CLEs or conversations, podcasts and publications allow us to identify the challenges and find solutions. Um, I have noticed in the past years we have not been static and in, in allowed the machines to take over uh, us. A lot of things we do in our life, we have technology to assist us, but we still have to sign we're getting close to April tax season. We have to sign our tax forms, even though we could have systems help find the information. Um, you know, so there's a lot of stuff. Even if we go to court, you have to sign uh, forms under penalty of perjury. Um, but there's information, there's technology out there to help make your day to day a little bit more efficient. Um, and that's something I'm I'm really optimistic about um, because yes, there's some instances where where we've seen um, individuals. Uh, do do some stuff that that is um, you know filing a, a, um, a the New York case where Avianca where um, the lawyer rubber stamped um, citations that were hallucinated by the generative AI um, and he was sanctioned for that 
But I think in the industry, we are, we are bouncing back and learning that we've already been able to address sloppy lawyering that is out there. Um, so that is something where, you know, as Alyssa said, is, is you can get on ChatGPT and, and, and draft a memo to somebody about how to make a, you know, a, a trip um, and p- pick out the highest, you know, just really things that, that before took a long time to do. And if you had no background, it was challenging. And I, I enjoyed um, a young man who's interested in coding. And chatting with him, I said, you know, coming in D.C. in a couple of weeks is the International Association of Privacy Professionals. You as a coder should go there because we're always telling folks we have to have a lot of people at the table to have a good conversation. But to have coders and policy and as a political science major, those folks at the table really make the output uh, exciting. So it's not, you know, I think of the cyber. Um, if that was the dominant conversation, our, our login information would be 28, 30 characters long. And so we're trying to find that reason there. Um, so I'm excited for this and happy. And and that is something I think for folks who get involved, you know, that is the key is just getting involved and, and seeing what are the issues and challenges for folks to deal with. Thank you, Nick. I'm actually going to use your example and ask Becca about it. Uh, you said you can ask AI to write you a, a letter, for example. And so Becca, Professor Mike Watkins of University of Mississippi said AI is like kind of changing how we look at education. We are rethinking plagiarism, guidelines, grading, and even uh, lesson plans. And so he suggests that AI is changing what education in general is really about. He, he asked, what are we doing here when it comes to campuses and, and, and education? So, um, uh, do you think or do you say uh, how do you respond to this and and are you concerned that some aspects of our lives will witness a radical change that we might not be ready to have uh, in 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 a short period of time in response to uh, in response to the AI te- technology? Sure. Well, I just want to begin by saying that I worked in higher education for eight years, and I know how intense it can be to not be certain if your students are really producing their own ideas and integrating the information they're learning in your classroom with their own knowledge. However, um, I think Nick kind of touched on this earlier, some of the AI detection tools that universities were hoping to really use. There's some problems sometimes with how their outcomes are not always accurate. Um, Sometimes it makes you question the validity of a student who's actually doing their actual writing. Uh, But I think a better, bigger picture way to approach education and AI's role in affecting it is to think more about how to sort of rethink our approaches to how we're teaching. Um, I know that it would be if I was teaching right now, I would try to come up with some interesting ways to get my students to demonstrate that they've interpreted and processed ideas beyond just writing. Um, I would maybe call them out on the spot and ask them to talk about the ideas. I would look at how they're already learning. My niece loves YouTube videos. A lot of my friends' kids use video to learn and to express themselves creatively and what they've learned. And I think educators just need to have faith that we have so many purpose-driven students that really care what's happening in the world. They just want to have other ways to express their ideas. And again, I think it just speaks to this approach that I think is really applicable here, human-centered AI, right? Like encouraging them to use it to maybe get them to use generative AI on purpose to do an assignment and then asking them to critique it, make them active players in understanding AI is a tool and a creative collaborator, but not an end-all be-all solution of finding quick and easy answers. I also think, and I think Alyssa touched on this earlier, there's some amazing opportunities in education to upskill a lot of people who normally wouldn't have traditional pathways. Um, I think it's the GitLab Foundation has an AI for Economic Opportunity Fund that gives out money for different organizations that are helping these emerging uh, leaders and, and young people really learn about AI and incorporate it into their future jobs. So I think there's a lot of hope and possibility, but again, it has to be tempered with maybe readjusting our approaches to how we do things. And also having high expectations and believing in the creativity and the way people are learning that's very different from maybe how we grew up. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Becca. Um, 
Elisa, in light of the concept used uh, by Becca, which is human-centered AI, and uh, given that you provide solutions to businesses uh, uh, and organizations, uh, what type of employees these organizations will hire in the future? And what will happen to the college education in response to that? Um, so it's, it's the career and the education that leads to that career. What do you think will happen there? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting and I uh, forgive sort of the simplistic analogy, right? But, you know, when when we think about spell check, right? Or like what when when we, who doesn't use Grammarly or spell check in order to make sure that you're, you know, that the, the writing that you have ha, uh, is sort of at least seen from that standpoint. And, you know, today we don't consider that cheating, right? That someone used spell check to do work, right? Or that I go to chat GPT because I'm trying to figure out an Excel spreadsheet formula that would normally take me an hour to go search for a video to try to find the person who's sort of talking about the thing I'm talking about to see by, by analogy, could I fix it? Versus I just say, here's the formula, I'm getting an error and it gives me three versions and within two minutes I've fixed the problem, right? So I think to the point that um, Becca was making earlier about sort of the transformation of education, I think it will also be the transformation of just how we work and what we accept as a baseline level of tools that we use to make our work more effective. Right. And so whether it's how I put together an essay or a project for my science project in my class or how I approach my work so I can get more work done faster and focus on the higher order work that requires human judgment. Right. And human deep thinking in order to make that happen. Now, in this in the near term, we're going to have, you know, you know, progress never happens smoothly, right? It's kind of a step function and it's about sort of adjusting and learning as we go. But I think, you know, when I, you look at the future employer or the future student, it's going to be that there's just more layers of some of this technology that are just baked in to how we do the work and then the new work that happens on top of it because the work is now different because there are things we used to have to do, like go for two hours to go figure out how to figure out the Excel model, right? And now it's done in 30 seconds, right? Which then allows you to, to think about the, the results of what that was and what that could mean in terms of whatever piece of analysis I was doing. I've gone to a whole nother level because of that level of technology that can help me with that. Just like 10 years ago, it was like, wow, that corrected my spelling error, right? So I, I think that that's the other, the other analogy I'll use, remember when search started? Well, maybe some of you don't, <laughs> but remember when search started and we, um, there was this whole period where, where companies were like, I'm not gonna let Google see my pages. I'm gonna block that because I don't like that. It was kind of the point that Nick was talking about earlier. People gave up blocking it because then they could be found, right? So I think, you know, we're going to have some of these kinds of things where th th things seem like I don't want to do that, but then there's a trade-off and the answer is maybe I do, right? And so that's part of what we're also going to learn in this process. Um, I'm not sure if that completely answers the question, but I do think we're just going to have a leveling up that happens with everyone because there's just going to be some pieces we don't do it anymore. Um, and we, it's important we don't leave people behind as that's happening, right? We need to, that's a, an incredibly important thing we need to work through and it's coming. So let's figure out how we're going to deal with that. Right. Great. Thank you. And while, while we are at it, uh, at this point, uh, um, there's a question of how AI might impact hiring uh, like a hiring process for the, uh, you know, uh, staffing and planning and recruitment, all that process. Is that, do you see any change so far in the hiring process because of AI? 
I would pretty- say a couple of things is, is one is um, cover letters have, have that used to be like standard and all these things now where, you know, some of the tech companies, it's a very seamless fashion. Um, and then getting the information out there, um, you know, for retention. Um, but the one thing we have to be mindful of is how are we training AI to recruit? Um, and that is something I think is an updated process where um, if we just, for example, let's go to sentencing. Um, if we just have, you know, a, a machine that was sentencing was based on 100, that's not really rich data. But if it had 10,000, um, that could be helpful to a judge. Judges, if the federal, they have a lifetime appointment and, and sentencing is, is advisory, but still judge, this is a, 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 a tool to help you. So same with hiring is we want to make sure the information that's being obtained um, is, is a wonderful sample, which is always hard to do. But I think as we've discussed is we're always trying to level up and improve the situation, but then long-term for companies, they can predict how long this project is going to take, what part of the, the globe is this going to happen at? What are the hours? You know, what are the you know opportunities? Um, and so that's something too, where instead of having this knowledge gap of reports, as we bring up our our friend Excel, you know, I, I was asked a question one time. I used to go to the library and think about things, and now if we can get that thought, instead of spending twenty minutes to figure out the Excel formula, we can get that to you know twenty seconds. That allows our thought. And so that's something too. And it's instead of building large recruiting platforms, going to various events, we may be able to focus in and, and find individuals who really want this opportunity. Okay. Uh, for the remaining time, we have almost three minutes left. I would like to ask each of you to kind of give us throughout, you know, based on your experience, what is the most uh, uh what is your favorite thing about ai and what is your concern and it it could be the extreme favorite the extreme concern or anything like you can share with us to take with us today can we start with becca uh sure i think my favorite part of ai right now is just using it to do design and do creative work as, again, as a collaboration with me adding my own elements to it after an initial draft. I think that's tremendously exciting with art, music, brainstorming for writing. The thing I am most terrified about is definitely some of the major risk issues that we lightly touched on, things like data privacy breaches, um, using AI to create a fake video that will sway an election. And, and there are all kinds of disinformation concerns that I think are tremendously worrisome. This is true for the election year. Yeah. Uh, Nick? Yeah, I think the the, the, the joy is it, it works. It, you know, you don't have to have a sophisticated C++ Python coding language. You can go in there um, and use it and, and do so many different things with it. And the fear is that is this information correct? Um, is this spell check correct? Did I did I use the correct version of there, even though there's no squiggly line under the spell check? So that is something. It, sometimes it's very easy to use and exciting, but sometimes we have to double check the math. True. Alisa? Um, I would say my favorite part of AI is at that ideation phase uh, that I think Becca was also alluding to. And I also love it for the analysis to see patterns that you couldn't otherwise see um, uh, as a human, right? Being able to leverage it, to be able to look across big data sets and see and have new deep insights that could be really impactful. The thing that worries me the most is sort of the relationship between deep fakes and people just not trusting anything. Right. Um, and I think um, the kind of lack of watermarking, for lack of a better word, the, the provenance of where data comes from and all of that, and that Gen AI was basically released without that, I think is um, a big challenge. Right. But in the half full, I think that AI can also help us identify when AI is doing that. Right. So it's just about making sure that those systems catch up. So that uh, we aren't that AI isn't more of a contributor to a lack of trust in society of people believing what they see. Great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becca, Alyssa, and Nick, uh, for this 
rich conversation. Uh, we hope we can continue this conversation uh, in the future with you in more details. Thank you. Thank you. Piper, you want to add something before we yes. go? Yes, thank you, Nader, for, for moderating and to all of our panelists and for everybody for joining in. We really appreciate your interest. There will be a poll that pops up when you exit. Please take 15 seconds and share your feedback. It's really helpful for us to, to hear your input. We'll be following up with the recording as well as the resources mentioned, so watch your email. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.